Previously on Zenochat, Justin, Tyler, Kat, Mary, Brielle, Chris, and Jesse all discuss the villains of the Xeno series. Now, for the first time, you will hear our discussion on the Xenosaga villains. Alright, then we shall go on to Xenosaga. Um, so first up, <laughs> first up is Vandercam again. He's back. <laughs> but it's a defense. He's back. Yes. In- instead of a cross, it's oh, an X on his face. Mark? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Vander. He yells at you for being lazy slacker. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> he is. <laughs> and he makes that clear right from the get go, too. Yeah. I forget if, uh,. Ramses calls Xenogears uh, Vanderkam a slacker or not. I think he does. And it's one of the references I my antenna went <laughs> went way up on at first. But I also don't remember that. Yeah. But he also appears in uh, episode 2 uh, whenever, or at least there's a parody. No, there's a parody of him appearing or something. I don't remember if it was him or if I it think was he someone has, else. Like, a, a brother? Yeah, but it was he it was does someone have else a brother. Was yelling, like a drill surgeon. Yeah, there was someone else in episode two yelling from a a sort of ship like thing on Milsha. That, really, like, I thought that was oh, him. That was yeah. Vandercam. Yeah, not him. That that yeah, was him. Was that him. was him. They just I, changed the voice just, actor. Okay. So, but it was yeah. But it he was, does have a, was, okay. a brother. That is probably one of the best parts. Yeah, okay. it was so was funny. Though. I, I still, two. I still remember Junior's face reaction <laughs> to that. It's so priceless. <laughs> that was probably one of my favorite parts of the episode two dub was the fact that they just decided, for whatever reason, to go from making Fandrikim like this, this like, um, this like you know really like unlikable character. And he still was unlikable, but just, they went from making him, like, this just terrible, terrible guy to a literal drill, military drill sergeant. <laughs> to the point, like, his voice even makes fun of all those movie drill sergeants. Like, what you, what are you up to, maggots? Like, oh yeah, my god. that's, like, right out of Full Metal Jacket. <laughs> yeah. <No>. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That is how they actually sound, too. <laughs> that is how they actually try and sound um, mm. in military boot camp as well, too. It's 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 ridiculous. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, and then but then after you beat him in episode two, that's uh, that's unfortunately it for him. I yeah kind of yeah, expected really him so. to return, but yeah, because I remember yeah, after the battle, deep. like you, if you try to approach him, he like it gives us like. Something pops on the screen saying you shouldn't like mess with it or something like that, and I'm like, so it sounds like they were gonna. He, man, you should have gotten rid of my Magus and replace him with Vandercam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, but yeah, he was he was terrible, sexist, very physically abusive to his subordinates. Like literally, the first like what fifteen minutes of the game when you first. See him. Yeah, he like he punches just one of them out. Punching yeah. one of them out. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. crazy. And he calls and he calls, yeah, he calls. He calls Shion a bimbo. Yeah, he's like a cartoonishly bad Ugh. boss. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like, ugh. Fun, fun little, re- fun, fun little nod to the to to the original and in, in in Gears, but probably a lot worse. Yeah. A lot mm-hmm. worse. Indeed. Yeah. So, shall we move to the next one? Sure. <laughs> yeah. This next one's a little yes. interesting. To- <laughs> yeah, I added her, but she she doesn't get a lot of screen time, and it's kind of unfortunate, yeah, but it's sadly. Orgella from Xenos Episode 2. Basically the space nun. Um, so... There's again. There's not much to her except she says some interesting things during her boss fight. Uh, like she curses sellers whenever she likes because she has multiple personalities, and it just makes it, it 
you assume that she was like either experimented on by Sellers or Sellers was involved in some way, but you don't really get to find out. What? Ugh. Damn you, Sellers! No, um, but more interesting thing about her, the one interesting thing about her is in the DS version of the game of episode one and two combined, when uh, mm -hmm. Takashi came back for the story, she was completely written out. Oh. She was Wait, completely Oga Oga written not... out of that. She's not in the that. DS game at all. That's crazy. Oh, I guess I didn't, nev I never noticed that I never saw artwork for her. That's, that's insane. Yeah, she doesn't I even mean, have a sprite. She doesn't even have a sprite in the game, and I have, and I've seen a lot of the model of the sheets in the game, which is a shame because oh, she has one of my favorite character designs, like in Xenos. She has a great. really, she has a yeah. really cool character design. Hated her boss. That yeah, literally almost made me stop yes. the game. <laughs> she is definitely one of the hardest boss of Xenos Saga too. <laughs> I remember I played the game, got to her, was level twenty. Kept dying, got so frustrated, I restarted the game, grinded oh, at no. the beginning of disc two, all the way to 40, and I still Dang. had difficulty with her. Yeah. But that's also because I didn't understand the battle system. I just recently learned how to play the battle system, and it's a lot smoother, but it's still a difficult game. And that's yes, it is. probably a difficult battle. You don't see her after that battle, right? No, 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 she 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 ends up uh, unfortunately dying right there, like uh, in the ship. Yeah, because the ship explodes afterwards. <laughs> yeah, it goes kabooms. Pretty much, she was just uh, somebody who was uh, a very faithful um, person to the patriarch. Yeah, space pope. I guess this is a good. yeah. This is a good transition to Space Pope. <laughs> yep, Patriarch Sergius. Which he didn't even have like a name until after Episode Two. Is that right? Because I don't remember them actually saying Sergius at all in Episode Two. But uh, I might be mistaken. I yeah. don't remember. I forget. He he was mentioned. I believe. Um, I think he's a, it's the same Patriarch in uh, in Pied Piper. And um, he definitely did have a uh, a spot in the Xenosaga episode three database. But other than that, I'm I'm not entirely sure if his name was mentioned in episode two or not. But yeah, he basically ends up being used, and like you fight him at the end of Xenosaga two, and he goes. He's basically the Usual, I'm the evil space pope <laughs> kind of character. <Yeah. laughs> One thing I do love is that it's just canon in the Xenosaga universe that the Catholic Church is associated with all of this mess, and it's like, oh, that sounds about right. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. He really wants a Zohar, yeah. but he really wants a Zohar, but of course he's being used without knowing that he's being used. So of course that's never gonna happen. Or he got it for a second and then it disappeared and got taken by the Testaments, I think, after you defeat him. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> he's the Shikhan of Xenosaga. No, I think he gets killed. I think he gets killed by the the, the Omega. I think. Was it an yeah. Omega laser that, like, basically is splatter him out of thin air or something? <laughs> oh, the Omega Rest Navae? Or, no, wait, no, that's episode three. I don't know what I'm saying, sorry. Just just a, the regular um, Omega we see at the end of Zinal Saga 2. I don't think mm -hmm. so, because he Which was the... He wasn't. He was the one I think with the the Zohar that was cr that was controlling, um, Omega because oh. in the beginning oh. of three they actually was mentioned that a pope, a, a priest, a, a patriarch is supposed to be the one um, it, controlling it. Oh, wasn't it the Which testaments that killed go keep it. that killed him? Yes, it was the testaments. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, ju I just remember him being killed by a laser beam or something. <laughs> yeah, they basically, the, the Patriarch ba basically got his taste of power. I believe he completely obliterated and destroyed the original Milsha. Yeah. And um, 
then you and your party go in there and have to get get take the power away from him but you're basically he, he's too much and that's when the testaments come in and they basically take away that power and they bring I'll, um a, another antagonist I, i'm gonna go ahead and try and not say the names too much because I don't want to go in and segue or anything, but they bring that character back into existence, and then the actual end, of, uh, the actual end game of you know Saka Two happens. But yeah, mm-hmm. Space Pope was definitely like literally he's he's so like forgettable kind of that literally mm-hmm. we don't even call him by his real name we just call him we just refer to him as Space Pope. <laughs> well, I mean, because he's like, he's like the, the, the last, but like, well, the before last, last battle episode saga too. Yeah. <laughs> and like, he's just he's like, less, he's just memorable by being this evil space pope with like funny faces. And that's how we remember about him, basically. <laughs> basically, he was like, Luster, I had more fun. F- I, I think I had, uh, I, I think I actually... I consider the cathedral, the actual cathedral, yes, a building you have to go ahead and fight, which I know you guys do. I'm doing this because the fuck <laughs> um, I consider the cathedral the actual final boss of the game, <laughs> the, ba- the battle oh, yeah. before him. That was yeah, a tough that, that, battle. That battle was tough, I remember. Yeah. He was just, he was a very lackluster, um... Literal cathedral. Actual cathedral. Cathedral. But yeah, Patriarch with Sergius was like he was a very lackluster um, final game boss, uh, technical I just final game rem- boss. I remember just farming him to get an item to pay off Matthew's debt. That was the most <laughs> I remember him for. <laughs> anyway, how about we yeah. move on to sellers? Dun, dun. I can't look at cells with a straight face anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. Maybe we should add that emoji in the YouTube version. So that people know what we're what we mean. It could be the thumbnail. Uh, I was gonna say, are we about Um, to talk about Space Elton John? Oh my god. Well he um what's the actor that he's uh, Peter, I think it's on... Peter Sellers. Yeah. <gasps> yes, Peter Sellers, and he's um he looks like he did in um oh god how I learned um, to stop worrying and yeah. love the bomb. Yes, yes, and Doctor Thank Strange. Love. Yeah. yeah, Doctor yeah. Strange Love. Yes, it's like this character is just a a love letter to Peter Sellers. Yes, but yeah, he's basically Joaquin Mizrahi. He's rival in a way and also we learned that uh Mizrahi like capped both of his kneecaps as well so I guess that's also a, a mm-hmm. reason why he should be mad at him it's a seed of some beef <laughs> mm-hmm. interesting to go ahead and note he this is a villain you never actually fight him you don't even really have an interaction with him you see this all through story scenario mm-hmm. um, he sure. you fight a lot of what he does also, a little side note: I said Space Elton John because uh, I was pl- when I was playing this game, my grandmother came into the room as I was playing, and she was like, "What are you playing?" I'm like, "Oh, I'm just I'm playing a sci-fi thing." Is that she's like, "Is that like a Space Elton John?" And I just I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. But yeah, he plays a lot yeah. more in the background as like someone who pulls some strings here and there like do certain like made certain things as well but yeah his voice acting was also very distinct in my mind oh yes. yeah it was like kind of nasally yeah wasn't he played by steve bloom uh, in episode three yeah in episode three okay yeah yes i know he's had like maybe two or three different voice actors throughout the series okay because um, I think in episode one he was played by Jameson Price. Yes, but he, only he was. Talked like for like maybe five minutes in episode one. Yeah, he speaks a lot more in episode three because we see mm-hmm. uh, like all of like what led the plot to go where it was. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. 
the only time that the main characters even actually interact with him is when he is playing decoy. And oh yeah, I remember for, that. He was in the yeah. Merkaba, right? Yep, yeah. he was like, playing decoy the end of for three? the Merkaba. Yeah, so and that, near the end of three. So that Yuria could go to the Durandal do his thing. <laughs> basically. Basically yeah. go while the, re- while the cast part. is there not to go ahead and uh, protect them. But he and he full well knew he was a scapegoat, and he even told the he told them leave, or you're just gonna go ahead and get you're just gonna go in and phase out of existence your existence yourself. Yeah, it, it's like he just basically just wanted to go ahead and like carry out his duty because he was kind of just like I think he kind of made peace with the fact that he was never going to be as good as Mizrahi. Yeah, in a sense. Yeah, pretty much. He just had to one up somebody in the end. Basically. So, kind of a funny side note about Sellers is that in the Japanese version, he's voiced by mm-hmm. Masaharu Sato, and that voice actor also played Dr. Eggman in one very old Sonic game <laughs> called Sega Sonic <laughs> the Hedgehog, and it was only released in the arcade. <laughs> So he did the voice clips for that. And oh, I just think that's really God. funny. Nice. That is funny. That that's is a funny poll. Uh, I guess we seconds. should uh, move to uh, the next one where uh, we have often heard the line being like, I am Richard. <laughs> My name is Richard. <laughs> Richard and Ermin, the Team Rocket of Zeno Saga. <laughs> yes. Um, just recently, I have le- I had learned that um, there are three drama CDs for Xenosaga that take place before mm-hmm. Xenosaga 2, and the third mm-hmm. one is where you actually are introduced to these two characters, which is why when he when, when he introduces himself in the first bo- um, in the first yeah it's the first boss no it's the second boss battle um, of uh, Xenosaga 2, he acts as if he knows you before and. All of us. I know everybody, like, in the fandom, anybody who played the game when it first came out, they're just like, who the fuck are these guys? Why are they acting like they know us? <laughs> That's my exact we, thing. We never got that supplemental su- supplemental material um, showing us how they met, but apparently Junior and everybody actually meet them uh, Ooh, during wow. an event in the drama CD. And I think there are a few people who are trying to loosely translate it right now because nobody uh, apparently until recently nobody even knew there was a third third uh, volume of the drama cds man i, I hope we do get a translation of that because mm-hmm. i am very curious now <laughs> yeah i remember there was a translation for like maybe half of the first disc a long time ago but then it the project stopped yeah um yeah Mm-hmm. I think some of that's on YouTube. Uh, Wate TV is the person who brought this to my attention. A very small uh, Zeno um, centric streamer, because uh, he is currently doing a playthrough of all the game of all the Zeno Saga franchise, and he refuses to finish episode one until he gets through the drama CDs as well too. Oh wow, that's mm-hmm. crazy! But that's so cool, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, of note, uh, I uploaded the drama CDs to Godsib last night. Yay! Ooh. Ooh. Oh, nice. Nice. Awesome. So check that out. I believe- yes, yes, that's, they ac- do. that's actually that's actually where we actually get to Does see Richard what they Richard also look appear like in a DS version instead of their yeah, robots. his awesome mm-hmm. sprite portrait thing. <laughs> yeah, and Richard is actually like fourteen years old. Yeah, it's so I was crazy. like, what? I yes. did not realize that until I re- reread over it and then Richard's actually 25 um, but yeah Richard is basically his uh, I mean Herman is Richard's personal retainer um, because I guess uh, Richard has a kind of like high, higher class within like the Ormus society and yeah, his family's rich got, yeah and he witnessed the death of his parents and his sister that caused him to get a uh, like a split personality and then Herman actually used to be in the Federation Navy with Captain Matthews which is also insane but yeah yeah. 
small world. Very much so. It's like, if I wish we kind of gotten more of those two. Yeah, but I guess same. we got more. We got yeah, we got more of them than we did Orgala, but it still it it still sucks. Yeah, yeah, and considering it was like outside content we knew nothing about, like every time they appeared, it looked like more of a gag, and we did not really know who they were. We're just like, but who are you? <laughs> But, like, yeah, for okay. me, I just always identified them as, like, Team Rocket of Zill Saga. Because <laughs> they appear, they get defeated, and they disappear, and they come back. <laughs> and they, they always do this, like, my name is Richard <laughs> type thing. Yeah. You fight them a total of three times. Twice yeah. in Xenosaga 2, and once near the end of Xenosaga 3. Yeah. Yeah, I honestly didn't expect them to show up in Episode 3, because I basically thought they would, it would be like what would happen with Orgala. She just kind of faded away. Or, But uh-huh. it was good to at least see them one last time, I guess. Bye, Richard. Yeah. We only remember your name because you told us. My name is Richard. I assume you remember. Hermit's <laughs> 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 just like this, this silent type. Very, very silent person. Yeah, hey. silent big guy. <laughs> yeah. Shall we move to the next one? Oh yeah. Yes. Supreme. Yes. So I. You. Yeah. I I added her late because I just remembered her. Um, That's but yeah, okay. It the, happens. <laughs> she is the sister mm-hmm. of uh, Junior uh, uh, Guinan and Albedo. Um, yeah, and she she basically follows uh, Yuriev and is supposed to be, I think, the equivalent of Ganyan in terms of, like, uh, she's also a sort of executioner, if I remember mm-hmm. right. It's been a while. Yes. I believe, if yes. I'm remembering yes. correctly, she kind of keeps him in check, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh-huh. Yeah. But yeah, she- She's pretty cool. I wish she had more because she was she was a very interesting character. But sadly, she was. she's also another one of these characters that doesn't get as much screen time as she could have gotten. Yeah, she very she very much like uh, kind of blindly followed her father to to her death. Yeah, pretty much, and like um, I believe Junior tried to uh, wake her up, but I think it only half work? I don't I don't fully remember. It's been a while. Nah, uh, if I'm I'm trying to remember myself because I just recently played three two. Um she fell um she followed her father because I feel uh it it just always seemed like the reason she did is because that was her purpose. Yeah. But uh, when Junior tries to snap her out of it and get her on the wrong side, she all she mentions is that he betrayed everybody. So it's like she kind of had a deep, se- deeply rooted grudge against him for what happened in Milsha. Yeah. Um, when they were all kids, with the Udu incident and everything. Which is fair. We didn't even know she was alive until she just suddenly pops up in episode three. We didn't even know she. she uh, we didn't even know she was a number until episode two. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. But still, it, it was nice that uh, she was part of this, considering, uh, like, among the URTV, they did mention that uh, the female versions of URTV were more rare to happen, and like, on top of that, she was like one of the special ones, it was like kind of cool to see that happen. It's just sad that she wasn't you know, used a bit more within the plot, but at the same time I understand because they had so many characters and so much round to cover. <laughs> mm-hmm. They were very ambitious in Zeno Saga. Yeah, she also had a great yes. character design that was underutilized. <laughs> oh yeah, very much sure. so. If you actually take a look at her like eyes, she has like four or five different colors in them, and they are beautiful. They are based off of the actual citrine mineral. Yes. So I just remember, but weren't our battle quotes really funny? Like, I remember David mentioning that before. Uh, hold on. Let me just check our Zill Saga thing, because I'm like, I remember some quotes being kind of funny, if I can find some quotes. Yeah. 
they're very. Uh, oh, I don't wait, remember her oh, quotes. Oh, quotes like, "Oh, you want me to step on you too?" <laughs> oh, you want me to step on you too? <laughs> oh. I think you need some stiff punishment <laughs> type thing. I think you need some stiff punishment. She's a uh, oh very uh, dominatrix, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Some of those uh, episode two bosses had like a vibe to them. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> I can't remember those quotes because I just remember really, really dreading her boss battle because she had an ability that would take you immediately down to one HP, and then she would try and do a boost and immediately wipe out your party. It yeah. was such a pain in the ass. And if uh, and if you didn't have Bestali on at least one of your characters. You're basically doomed. Yeah, she was nasty. Yeah, she, I just remember, like, it just snapped into my brain. Like, I remember David mentioning those quotes and be like, "Whoa!" <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I had to go to the character. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Shall we move on? Yes. 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 Okay. So this one's kind of a goofy one, but uh, the Dark Professor. Which is the rival to uh, the professor, um, <laughs> who? Yeah, we did. He wasn't introduced until Zenos episode two, but he's 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 basically just the professor, but evil. Um, <laughs> but evil. I'm <laughs> <laughs> trying yeah, to yeah. remember uh, him. <laughs> Like like the professor, he just wants to make giant robots, uh, and like they're basically rivals, and like they they want to make better robots than the other extraterrestrial. Like he wasn't intru- was he only introduced during the post game of Xenosop so two? Yes, or that might have been. Yeah. No, he was. He um, Dark Darker Erdikaiser is actually a post game boss battle, um, mm-hmm. in episode two. But yeah, Dark Professor um was basically just uh the game was like here you're gonna have urtikaiser except instead of just having a rehash of urtikaiser we're gonna go ahead and make this rival to the professor called the dark professor and you're gonna have to go ahead and fight against the dark urtikai (laughs) (laughs) basically and then in episode three uh the poor guy basically uh he passed away before his uh, his his dream could be accomplished, but uh, his subconscious in a little like monkey like robot basically yes. finished the Urtikaiser Sigma. Oh yeah, I remember the the monkey robot. That's what I was trying to look up. I was like, wasn't there a monkey in this thing? I I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just thought it was like a like just a just like you know a normal monkey robot, and then you find out. No, that's actually the Doc Professor. And then you have to go ahead and fight Urtikaiser Sigma, which, um... That thing's voice. Yeah. Urtikaiser Sigma. Fun fact, that's also Yuriev's voice actor in the English dub. With the hope of Dark Professor within me, Urtikaiser Sigma is here! Yeah. Oh my god, I forgot this about so, that. 80 so hours so of goofy. gameplay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think the next uh, one, if you need the yeah. next one, is for Cat. Oh yeah, right, Cat. Yes. <laughs> it's time. Professional sad boy <laughs> time. It's time. To boy. Uh, oh, there he is. Okay. All right. Actually, yeah. you have two of yep. your boys back to yes, back. back. Yep, to back. back to oh, back. Yes. Back to back. <laughs> anyway, it's uh, cat time. <laughs> so, um. It was pretty clear to me when I first uh, picked up uh, Xenosaga 1 that Cherenkov was a huge callback to Ramses. And I was like, what? Ramses? In my Xenosaga? What? Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, the the way I recognized him uh, was uh, his interaction with uh, Vandercam. I was like, wait. Blonde asshole guy with stuff on face yelling <gasps> it's the commander they even call him the commander uh and 
I, I was not expecting the backstory that they that they put on him. Uh, he was a professional sad boy. Uh, I I'm pretty sure that comment came from Bot, uh, and I love that. Was that was actually comment. me. Oh. <laughs> that was, that was... <laughs> uh, so basically, uh, he's there's a lot of uh artificially enhanced humans in this setting. Uh, and this uh, Cherenkov's uh, origins were not nearly as rough as Ramses's, but uh, he was genetically engineered to be a uh, kind of a, a not a child soldier, but like he was raised as, as this weird one-off experiment to create extra violent soldiers for the purpose of waging war, and uh, like he just kind of. He is the only survivor to the one conflict that he got to be in. Uh, and they were like, oh, yeah, we're done. You're discontinued, by the way. Go try to live a normal life. And he uh, just wasn't programmed to really have that kind of normal life. Uh, I believe the the other Cherenkovs, I just sort of think of them. I think of Cherenkov as the last unicorn. <laughs> Every once in a while, just because there was supposed to be more of him, uh, but he's the last. Uh, and like <laughs> just the <laughs> the imagery of more like a herd of Cherenkovs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm picturing uh, I forgot where the <laughs> herd of Cherenkovs just like walking around in a field saying their own name. <laughs> 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 uh, anyway, uh, so he was unable to, to integrate with regular society, so he ended up, I think, as like a construction worker or something, and he killed a man, and that was bad, and they sentenced him to jail, and uh, the punishment that he got was, okay, we're we're we really don't like you, we we really don't like you enough to turn your punishment into an experiment that's like, hey, you know, you won't remember you killed this guy, and you'll have a new lease on life. You won't remember your disillusionment with uh, like, general civilian stuff. You don't remember where you came from, so you won't be sad either. Uh, and, uh, but the, the thing is, is that the memories that they replaced out um, kind of sucked and the living situation they put him in was kind of on like house arrest and the person who was his lawyer was pretending to be his wife uh but she was only doing it as sort of like a civil service so she could get permission to get cloned uh and that was uh not revealed to him until a certain point where he was like going through the mail uh and like he found the, hey, we cloned you, congratulations, here's your daughter. Uh, and um, it's sort of like, the way Cherenkov reacted, he was just like, what? And his wife was like, ha ha, uh, you suck. Uh, I did this on purpose, <laughs> you're evil. Uh, or, or rather, you did. Uh, I did this on purpose, I'm evil. Uh, and he was like, "Yeah, I sm- consider putting her on his list because she's pretty <laughs> right? bad." Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, literally she's yeah. Her one, more black and white villains. Yeah, <laughs> so, like, her, she one, basically, <laughs> she her caused... one quote was like, uh, "Sorry to sorry to cut off, but just uh, her one quote was literally like, you thought I you thought I married you out of love? I can get enough love out of this.'" And she just showed like a UMN connection device and threw it at him. Yeah, yeah. And just that one line, just like that, just shows you how disgusting of a person she was. Yeah, yeah, yeah she was terrible. Bad wife. You know, a while back, I was rewatching the cutscenes for Xenosaga, and I remember getting to that part and just thinking to myself, "Why is she so evil? Like, what the hell?" <laughs> Cherenkov really isn't that bad of a guy, but she's just terrible to him. Yeah, yeah. And she I- doesn't even. She doesn't even have a name, and we remember her so vividly. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And I think it's like I the the relationship that I was going through at that time personally uh, resonated too much with that. <laughs> uh, so I kind of glommed onto Cherenkov at that point, uh, despite all the murder. 
he he did a murder. He murdered his wife, and then he murdered the clone. Uh, but also, when he murdered the clone, it's weird. Like it's like she recognized him, and she said the buzzword "garbage." which was used as a buzzword for Ramses. And I was like, holy shit! Like, uh, corkboard, red red yarn, uh, <laughs> <laughs> image. It's all connected! And then, uh, after, after he dies, he's never spoken of again in canon. <laughs> Not directly. It's so funny, because yeah. I think that one, the garbage scene, is probably more than a lot of people know about the game. <laughs> And it really is, out of context, the funniest thing in that entire game. Yes, And it's it such is. a horrible scene, and it's really bad. Especially when you consider, like, the layers of, like, human experimentation and stuff that's in the Zunasaga universe. It's really sad, but it's really fucking funny, too. Yeah, it's like the way yeah. it's staged. Yeah. It's just, like, garbage! And then Cherenkov's eyes get, like, his pupils... <laughs> And smaller, <laughs> like his pupils shrink, and then it's like, ah! God, it is so much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of cringe, but ooh, ooh my favorite, Shirley, <laughs> which is probably how how Margulis feels about it. <laughs> Shrinkle's wife looks like she would be like an awful politician. I don't know why. Yeah, she just looks like she... a terrible white woman. Like, she looks like a wasn't Karen. she a politician? Yep. No, she Karen Shrinkoff. Yeah, that's, that's Karen her Karen kid, Shurinkoff. canon name. Karen Karen Shurinkoff. Shurinkoff. I always thought she was okay. I always thought she was a, a lawyer slash politician mm-hmm. advocating and trying to like look good and getting good light just so she could go ahead and get a get the get the permission for the clone. I don't remember the the politician oh. line. It could be true, uh, but I just thought she was his lawyer. <laughs> No, it just oh, <laughs> she was just terrible. David just mm-hmm. uh, it just wanted to point it out because it was just so funny. David just added a comment under a picture we posted on our thing saying the true villain of Zinosaka. <laughs> yes, so that could be a whole episode. <laughs> I gotta find it, but um, a while back, yeah. I remember I took a screenshot of the final boss in FF7 when you're fighting Sephiroth, and then I photoshopped her face on Sephiroth's body. <laughs> yes! Yes, that I would funny. love to see that. Yes, Sam, I would love to see that as well. Yeah. I think about my ex- uh, my exes, and one of them is very much like Cherenkov's wife. Oh, no. uh, and uh, I think that's why I'm like this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, are we ready to move on? Yes. Yeah. I guess yes. uh, you why can don't move we talk on to about your the... next suspend, though. <laughs> yes. Why don't we? T- why don't we move on to the one person who actually gave uh, the character above? a purpose in life yeah so like margulis is into killing people because killing people for the good of god is good right right uh (laughs) so i i believe margulis picked cherenkov up because he was a very dangerous life recycling variant and uh to him that represented a uh a very powerful playing card uh for him uh and uh i think he did the thing where hey you didn't have anything before let's give you something let's give you structure let's give you medication so you can control your crazy uh killing powers uh and um jesus i think when I was experiencing Xenosaga and I was mad about my ex, <laughs> I I really wanted somebody in my life somewhat like Margulis to give me structure. Uh, and that never happened, but uh, that's also probably a good thing because Ormus is a fucking cult. Uh, and uh, Margulis uh, is a really powerful member of that cult, uh, but he's also the kind of person, he's like a space version of Javert from uh, Les Mis, <laughs> Les Mis <laughs> if you like musicals. Uh, so basically, he's the guy who goes after a thing and doesn't stop. 
and that that kind of um he he shares a little bit of his uh persistence with uh Ramses as well but not the look but he he's got the coat they gave they gave the sad stuff to Cherenkov and they gave the coat to Marculus <laughs> <laughs> and uh I like to think that Cherenkov and Margulis sort of like merge souls to become Ramses later on. <laughs> uh, if we do the, the Xenosaga and Xenogears are connected kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, uh, Margulis is a incredibly dangerous person. Um, he has a lot of charisma. Uh, he has a lot of, well, during most of the games, he has a lot of faith in what he is doing is right despite what he's doing is murder uh, and <laughs> it's like he has he, he's not conventionally attractive uh, but his presence is is attractive to me but the the values are not uh, and Ormus sort of like has similar things to uh, to Solaris in that they are this, this society who wants the things for itself and sort of like dumps all of the oh hey if you're part of the society you're better and you can say that people who aren't in the society suck uh and that sucks and is very bad in real life and very dangerous uh i should not like margulis but the circumstances under which i like Cherenkov cause me to like margulis uh just <laughs> based on in story and in character stuff but I mean, let's face it. Like, I think most of us adore Margulis just for the fact <laughs> Margulis that Margulis is a very he, interesting character. He's a very yeah. interesting uh, antagonist, but also like he's just fun because he he's also basically a uh, Jin's rival. Yeah, and like he's, it, it he's gives very us physically us, active. <laughs> yeah, it gives us so many like goofy like type rival moments mm -hmm. <laughs> with Jim mm -hmm. that like it's hard to not like him. He also gives yeah. a very compelling like window into like the cult that surrounds, you know, Xenosaga yeah. and all of this being one of its most powerful and, and compelling members. Yeah, and also just like the image of like like it says in the cliff notes, a follower blindly following faith's empty words and promises. Yeah. Which uh, I guess would go into the next part of wait, talking wait. about him. Is that before before that mm -hmm. before that we got to mention that he's he's a really good cook. Wink <laughs> or not? <laughs> <laughs> like you know that pixelated food we have to bring up, bring back up every few episodes oh, because yeah. it's funny. <laughs> the kid cuisine. Oh, <laughs> the cuisine. Oh man! Every space. Is food the food is here cuisine. unsatisfactory? <laughs> I may have said it in another episode, but that's like one of my favorite things in this series. <laughs> yeah, but that's it's the so thing. We, we, it's kind of becoming a running gag now. We have to bring it back every time we have a yeah. chance to. But yeah, now we, now you can move on. <laughs> I guess this also. Sorry, oh. um, I guess this also mm -hmm. evolved into whatever the sandwich meat was in Xenoblade Two. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe <laughs> sandwich. Um, but I mean, before we move on, I just wanted to mention how, I mean, at at the end, Margulis found out that Wilhelm was basically manipulating that whole religion to get what he wanted, and it, it, it disillusioned Margulis so much that, I mean, he, he didn't, broke him. like, get, yeah, he, he still fought Jin and them at the end, but at that point he was looking for any, any purpose to his life other than the one that turned out to be a lie. Yeah, and I think in yeah. a way was... I think in a way he wanted to uh die in a battle and at the ends of his rival, if possible. I think oh. at this point he just had nothing left and he didn't care. And the worst the worst part is, um he didn't even get uh killed by his by the rival which was this is the part i was gonna go to move on um say like you know maybe this is a good place to move on to the other side of his character which was the rivalry with the oh, the yes, main character's yeah. brother um but yeah um in the japanese version which if you've played the game uncut um he self-destructs after you fight him he is one of the last boss battles of the third game and um, 
in the Japanese version, it's cut in the in the American version, unless you have the undub version, which is a modded version of the Japanese yeah. cutscenes and audio yeah, over the stabs, English. So. He mm-hmm. commits up. He he basically oh, commits up. Wow. Goo. I yeah. forgot yeah. about that. I forgot mm-hmm. about that too. But he does. It's true. Yeah. It is like he didn't. He he, he wanted just us. He he wanted like that that fight. But I feel I think it wasn't Jin like just a little too um hesitant to go ahead and give Marculus what he wanted because he had already just lost uh, <laughs> the next character we're about to talk about. <laughs> oh yeah, that's yeah. Right. Let's actually let that's a good segue. Let's let's get into that character. And that is mm-hmm. Pellegrin. Yes. Yeah. Pellegrin so, yeah, is a cool character. <laughs> yeah, she is also another member of uh, Ormus, but there is definitely some tension between her and Margulis and Jin. Yeah. Uh, from what I remember, uh, Pellegrin, Margulis, and Jin all studied under Xi'an and Jin's grandfather for sword stuff. And um, I think... Jin liked Pellegri, but Pellegri didn't like Jin as much as, uh, and didn't like Jin as much. So she, I remember the line, you ignored my feelings, uh, coming from Jin. Uh, and ran away to the colonel. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't, she didn't, she, she did leave with Margulis when Margulis, like, I think Margulis killed Jin's grandfather. Um, and this was this like huge betrayal, but she didn't leave because of Margulis. She left because of Ormus. Like she had huge mm. loyalty to Ormus, and I thought that that was a pretty uh, unique choice because, like, the obvious choice was was like, "Ha ha, I love your girlfriend. She's not your girlfriend anymore." <laughs> like troll mustache moment. But uh, Pelegri's, uh agency uh, being unique was pretty cool. I thought. Yeah, I've always had a soft spot uh-huh. for her. Mm-hmm. She looks mm-hmm. very cool. I wish I looked like her. I think I had my hair somewhat like hers for a little bit, but my hair is too curly to keep short uh, yeah. and, and get that, that look. When I tried to do Pellegrin hair, I just looked like a Karen. <laughs> yeah, she she does oh. have the exact Karen hairstyle, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, right. it always was interesting that uh that she did go ahead and leave because of a loyalty to Ormus and uh, her faith um, over like you know the cliche oh I'm going to choose this man over you romantically ha 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 trope that we see so so common and uh, commonly and often it was a nice change of pace mm-hmm. for a motive and a reason to uh go 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 on to the bad bad side instead of uh, stay on the Side of air quotes good, <laughs> yeah. And I think um, in Xenosaga One, she somewhat seems like sort of a moderate. Uh, but once you get her to Xenosaga Three, she's scarier than Margulis. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. She is. <laughs> yeah, I re- I remember in Episode One when they was it Ariane where they it completely disappeared and mm-hmm. Margulis was like, Who, what is like didn't really care about the amount of people that died and she was like the actually the only one that cared. I was like Yeah, oh, she okay. she cared about the innocent. She was like their their lives could have been spared. We all we needed was this. And so on and so forth. And he basic and Margulis like basically like I they're think not people. they're not Which... they're not people. They're just like, you know, are are you are you hesitant? Are you having like second thoughts about all we've done, all we've done to realize it? What are a couple million people's lives to our great plan, basically? Yeah. Okay. Shall we Hurry. move to the big beef of uh, <laughs> the villains? Mm, yes, this is this is a big one. The, the test of <laughs> oh, it. Yeah. Ooh. Yes. Ooh, and uh, Brielle had the. Uh, a little highlight over that. I wrote a good, decent bit about these ones because they are so interesting to me as villains. Because um, 
and uh, I'm going to probably ramble a little bit, but please, anybody, please jump in with me as this, because there's a lot of characters here. There are yeah, four sure. total. Oh yeah, um, we'll all help out. Yeah, yeah we'll each one of out. them. It's fun. Each one of them are so interesting and different in their motives behind what the, why they do what they do. And um, I actually want to start. I'm actually going to go down the list instead, and I feel that we should instead go ahead and start off with the first one that we ever see sees face. Um, actually. I feel we should start with Virgil. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Say that the the top one's gonna be the last one because save save the best for last. <laughs> save save like you know. Oh, you know these characters aren't too bad. To oh, that's kind of messed up. To we hate. Oh, I have some words on him. <laughs> I have some very choice words on him that I'm gonna be bringing out. Yes. Okay, <laughs> Good. Then. Um, but right. yeah, Virgil first. Okay. So we go with. Yeah. Virgil first. Mm-hmm. Um, to just like give you an idea of how, what he is uh, to like a, in a player's perspective, uh, he is he just seems like um, an asshole that hates realians. Um, He's basically you notice him very first. <laughs> he, kind of racist. I, yeah, basically, but um, that's only the outer shell. Yeah. And when you learn his backstory, he is actually probably one of the saddest and most like sympathetic characters in most it, it, out of these villains. Yeah, he is. Um li- literally as as Bot wrote down his backstory makes you cry every time. Yes. Oh yeah, I remember crying that part hardcore. I think I wrote like, that, I but know. yes. But it's oh, also because okay. <laughs> it's also because um, the music in that spot with them is just so whoa. But before we get there, like mm-hmm. yeah, we kind of start uh, seeing him in the Wobbling Day. Wobbling Day. Oh my god, how do I say this again? <laughs> Wobbling Day. But uh, yeah, we see him there. Uh, like he gave us this bad impression at first, like. Uh, uh, Brielle was mentioning and um like later on like he, he also whenever the Gnosis come around you have him in your party a little bit like he fights with you and then well he's kind of coldly killed by Cosmos because yes. you know statistic and oh I must save the vector people he was, he, and he's in the way <laughs> he was just in the way Literally. Yeah. It, that scene is a million times and... better if you play Jason Derulo's mm, What You Say. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Another interesting <laughs> thing to, uh, because this is the way I've always seen it anyway, is that first scene when you're introduced to him, Xion just like looks as if she had heard a ghost when she like startles when she hears his voice. And it's like such a subtle little thing because you think because at first you're like just like oh this just must be the way she reacts but when she hears like anybody else talking that she hasn't heard before she doesn't react as like suddenly like that and then you find out that he actually knew her when she was a kid when she was like between 8 and 10 years old Yeah, and he was a soldier from the enemy sideline and Fibronia, a uh, Realian hybrid, um, found him, and despite the fact that he was an enemy soldier, she nursed him back to health, pretty much, to the point where he he was basically going to die, and she basically nursed him back to health. And She gave one of her hatred. organs as well? Yeah. Because she was a, um, she was a, she, uh, she was a, transient type i think she said she was i know it was it was something yeah basically um, i think her organs mm-hmm. were closer to a real human as where yes. like sh- she could transfer her organ in- into him and like i think her body would also recover after after a few days 
or something yeah, like she, that. Yeah, she was able to be put down under reci- um, recitation if she went ahead and powered herself off and returned right back into the Brinthos to receive proper treatment and basically replacement organs, yeah. which she did. Um, but because of that, and despite the fact that he hated her for it, because he was ready to go ahead and die on the on the on the line of duty as most soldiers unfortunately are trained to do um they ended up falling in love together yeah and it was really really like it was sweet but then it was bittersweet because she sacrificed herself again to try and buy him and she on time to escape when all the realians went insane due to the song of nephilim being um yeah and that scene was also pretty brutal because she was basically eaten alive by them oh there's so much blood in the actual japanese version it's 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 heartbreaking Uh yeah and yeah she also saw all of that or at least heard all of that i I don't remember how much she saw but i oh she saw it yeah, she saw it. She watched Fibronia be in Eden, and the, the, you just had this traumatized little girl just rushing out of this church, just trying to get to her parents. Yeah, yeah, because uh, I think Virgil also in turn uh, uh, tried to give give her time and gave her like I think that's when he gave her the protocol type thing or whatever. Like for that's her when to he learned some to- things. That's when he learned about, I think that's when he learned about its code, um, because she basically self-destructed herself to go ahead and save them, to try and get rid of those uh, rogue realians. True, true. Um, But because that happened, he ended up, he ended up having such a grudge against realians, and it can be seen in, like, two different ways. Uh, uh, Basically, I he uh, started. It, it's either he became a DME addict because of the organ transplant, or it's as a revenge and kind of like probably a weird way of coping. He became a DME ad- addict in general and just continued to uh, ingest uh, realian tissues uh, yeah, it- because he hates them for killing Feb. That and also it could have been because of like withdrawals from the um, organs being transplanted into his mm-hmm. body. Yeah, um. it's never a hundred percent explained, even in the database and even in his uh, entries. It's just said that he was a DME um, addict, and that the only kind of hint you get is when you see that oh, she gave her Rihalian. Uh, hybrid organs to him for him to survive. That explains that scar on his face, but nobody knows for sure. It's all left to interpretation at that point. Uh-huh. Um, but that was the backstory. And as Mary said, um, he got killed by Cosmos. Yeah. Um, after like being like look being shown to be like this person who does not care, who is willing to go ahead and get rid of all these realians and whatnot when the Woglinde is under attack, you're supposed to initially be like, You are a terrible, terrible person. Um and then while he's, you know, helping the humans go ahead and escape, because he doesn't have a bias against humans, he has a bias against realians. Um, he's trying to, like, you know, destroy the Gnosis, just, you know, basically have a, I wouldn't say have a good time, but just, like, feel like, you know, woohoo, you know, we're doing good, we're actually gonna get out of here, yeah, and then, um, uh, Gnosis was about to hit Shion, and Cosmos being, <laughs> uh, not only Cosmos, but, uh, programmed to protect Shion over everything, uh, literally just put a bunch of bullets through Virgil in order to keep her safe. Um, because especially at that point, Cosmos is all about logic algorithms and the biggest probability to, uh, to ensure her survival was to sacrifice him. 
It but just also seems conveniently petty. Cosmos yeah. Yeah. woke up and chose violence on that day. Yes. At the time, I thought it was like a <laughs> merely just a plot device to show how ruthless Cosmos could be. And how Cosmos always, you know, would put her prerogative always in front of human life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it all... And- but- and a show too so afterwards. I was too really as surprised well. to see Virgil oh. show up again, even and be a major villain. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, but also yeah. like his redemption around uh, Senosaga Tree is also uh, very interesting because you you get to see all of his backstory during uh, Senosaga Tree, but then um, you get to the church part uh, with Fabinol and. Then you face him, and like after the fight, like you see the ghost of Verbronia coming for for him and all, and like that's just as we said before, that's just a scene that makes us all cry because like the music build up in that scene and everything, like the composition, just like it's impossible to not get teary. <laughs> it's it's true. It really yeah. is hard not to, to get teary eyed. If you know their backstory, it's just it is impossible not to go ahead and like just yeah. he, he feel some sort of heartstring pull. Yeah, he basically uh stopped being a testament there in a way because he just go to the afterlife with her and I, I find this really cool. Like he finally um, found what he wanted to have, yeah. basically. He got that this rest. Yeah. Yeah, c- Kind of back up a little bit because the like the mm-hmm. the testaments are each people that were brought back to life by Wilhelm, um, yeah. and I was I was wondering it because we know some of the motivations of others that, to become testaments, but for Virgil, do you think maybe it was so that he could see Febronia again? I believe so because every testament like they. They're always chosen because their will shine to a certain amount, but also because they were not able to accomplish something in their lifetime. Mm-hmm. And like often the goal for them is to have a second chance at accomplishing that goal. Mm-hmm. And in Honestly. this case, I, I believe it was probably that like because it's a bit of it's in there, he's not gonna admit it loudly, but but like I'm pretty sure his goal was to see Fibronia again or have some kind of closure on that story. Is it ever confirmed? And he finally did. I apologize. Is it ever confirmed how okay. much agency the testaments actually had over being revived? Like, did they get a choice? Mm, no, because no, I always thought it was no. I don't think so. The only one that I feel like got a choice was uh, the final one, uh, oh. because the others did not go ahead and really get a choice. With Virgil, honestly, I think his agency for wanting to not die was... Fibronia uh, was not going to come back to life, regardless. He watched her die very, very mm-hmm. mercilessly. Um, but what I feel that his purpose was, was actually to go back to that point of Milsha some way or somehow because Milsha was still around her final resting place was around and kind of morbid but I always thought that because his final resolution was actually like you know de- re- desti- um, death and rest I always mm-hmm. felt like the whole reason he wanted to stay alive was actually to go back to that moment to just relive that before he probably unfortunately did yeah. probably offed himself honestly it's, it's morbid but that's that was one of the that's the way it came across with how his conflict was resolved especially like at first it's just like okay i think he just really wants to go back to milsha and go back to that spot but then you see how he ends up moving on and it's like oh he actually just wanted to die to go be back and to go be back with her that's really, really sad. Yeah. yeah. Um, shall we move to the next one? And the question is, uh, is the next one Alvedo? 
No, actually, the next one is the next. We're we're going to go in the order of how you see them unmasked, and the next one is Voyager. Oh, okay, sounds good. I just wondered because in my no. in my head, Voyager is kind of worse than Albedo in some points, but also Albedo is kind of equally worse in some others. <laughs> so, so I was like, which one do we go with? <laughs> so the reason I'm starting with I, I'm going I'm saying Voyager next over Albedo is the fact that Voyager is kind of in a sense black and white. Yeah, yes. Um even when he, even when you find out about his motives and what he's been doing in the background of Pied Piper even, um it's still not as much as Albedo cuz the last two are very very big. Oh yeah, um, when it comes to the testaments. Voyager so, was one of those that yeah. was a bit more push it aside because a lot of his story was like in Pipe Piper which was not released out of Japan <laughs> nope it's only been translated uh, 50 yep. there was there. a translation I I will <laughs> I will include a link to it in the notes if fans want to read it because it is excellent Yes, it, is it is one of the best things and um, ironically enough uh, just through um we were talking about this a little bit right before we started because I had just recently learned this through just, you know, out of, cur- out of sheer curiosity um, because uh, some of us thought we had found the files of the game. Oh. And then we found out that it translates, the, the Japanese con- um, kanji or katakana translates to the same exact thing of the um, the rat catcher. And that got me curious, so I started looking up the actual story. And when I read some bits of the story and some renditions of it, it's like, oh, this is actually very much um, based on um, Voyager's entire story is based off of um, the actual folklore tale. Basically, to sum the story up, not the actual video game uh, side story, uh, which uh, focuses on... Ziggy before he, um, when he's still human, but um, the Pied Piper is a tale where um, a um, piper came to a town that was happy dealing with a rat plague, offered um, offered to go ahead and get rid of the problem, and uh, the townspeople promised him all these riches and whatnot for doing that. Uh, so he had a magical flute. And led all the rivers to drown in a river. And when he came back for his compensation, they basically acted like nothing ever happened. Uh, some editions say a few days later, some day, some say a few weeks, a few months. Uh, he comes back not as cheerful, uh, quite vengeful, and takes that same flute and entrances every child in that village that basically said no to paying him and uh it is implied that he basically kills them he basically leads them all to their death um some records say that uh there were only two that survived one that was blind and one that uh ran back home to go grab their coat and the more kind of creepy thing about this story, and the reason why it's such a popular folklore tale, is uh, it's recorded in actual history that suddenly 201 children went missing that day. That um, is crazy. And, <laughs> and this was... Very specific. Yes, and this was back in, like, the, I think, medieval times? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the stuff involved actually relates to Voyager very, very well. Yeah, um, I can, I can already see some is. connecting dots, which is what you said. It's just like, mm-hmm. wow. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even see it. Like, I, I'm like, I know this story. How did I not even see this? Um, but one of the main ones being with the Voyager is how he he feels that he has a god complex even before he is a testament and what's even more interesting is how old he actually is when you first inter- you're first introduced to him you're led to think yeah. he's like this 36 year old man 
like probably like in his thirties. I think he was using some type of drugs or something to keep him yes. his body like young or something. Yes, he was keeping himself uh, alive. But the weirdest thing is, uh, despite the fact that usually testaments go ahead and become testaments upon death, why didn't he become a testament as soon as he died at the beginning of the game? Oh, true. Because he he came back and it. It probably scared the hell out of um, Ziggy back when he oh, was Sharon. human. Yeah, when he when he, um, when uh, it went ahead and uh, scared a uh, Jan Sauer's love interest Sharon Sharon yeah. Rosas because she was the nurse and she even got the death certificate and everything done. And then here's this guy just up and about running. <laughs> Walking away like it's nothing, and she's just like, "No, sir. What? Wait, what?" <laughs> yeah, and, um, that's kind of crazy. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. But I think yeah. maybe, uh, maybe at a time he had not sh- like gotten the specifics of what was required, maybe to become a testament. But at the same time, it's like, how did he come back exactly? <laughs> yeah, he he brought himself back. Yeah. Um, it's it's basically like implied and he doesn't become a testament until like the literal end of the game oh, uh, yeah. of, of Pied Piper and he just gets he's the only one who gets like a forward like all like actual like offering like would you like more power would you like be like to be able to you know lead these people and so on and so yeah, forth be the first um, one chronologically right like whew. yes yes yeah but um through the player's eyes, seeing them unmasked, he is the second. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's Virgil first. You see a sort yeah. of silhouette of him at the beginning of Xenosaga when Ziggy's having flashbacks, but it's very, yes. very blurred, and yeah. you don't see yeah. it in like yeah, clear yeah. view until episode two. Yeah, I think in uh, Xenosaga one, we just see uh, a splash of blood of his kid and a mm-hmm. silhouette of Voyager looking back at him. I think that's all we yeah. see in Xenosaga one. Yeah, in Ziggy's flashback. Yeah, because Voyager... Yeah. Yes, because Voyager basically killed Sharon and her son. Yeah, yes. because uh, he wanted to basically uh, save people from something by killing them and bringing the consciousness inside the UMN. <laughs> but actually, uh, himself. Yeah. If I remember, I believe he actually was saving and leading people into his own subconscious and he yeah. gave he gave uh Jan Sauer the um the choice or more so basically was trying to put uh put him to a wall's edge and um wall's back and say here if you would like to be happy with them come into me and with his only will and able to keep his sense of humanity that is exactly why Jan went ahead and committed suicide. He shot yeah. himself and killed himself so that way Voyager would not have control of him because that was his own human free will. He yeah. didn't want to go ahead and be taking it, taking basically like how he had to hear and because I'm not, I can't, I can't 100% remember if he watched him go ahead and kill his uh, newly found wife and son, an adopted son, or if he had heard and found out that they had died that way. Yeah. Also, I kind of feel like uh, saying out, li- out loud the line of the defeat that someone wrote, because it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> so his defeat is basically, Ziggy kicks him real hard in the nuts, and no one played Pipe Piper, so no one knows why this is significant. <laughs> 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 Which is why we're giving a short, condensed version. Also, one day! Yeah. Also, Lactus? Day. Question mark? <laughs> Question. Oh, you know that Lactus moment where we go, what? What? Who's Lactus? <laughs> yeah, um, that's very true. But uh, one d- one day we shall go in depth in Pied Piper with everyone. Yeah, that would be so. I think good. that would be a good episode. But it's also one where we'll find have it to do first. A huge research, and mm-hmm. you know, 
Mm-hmm. But yeah, I guess uh, should we yeah. move to the next one? Yes. yes. Or no. no. I think Big boy oh, or Beto. No. Yeah. <laughs> our favorite. <laughs> our favorite. I think Everybody Je- this guy. <laughs> oh, everybody's favorite. Yes. Yeah, Jesse. Did... <laughs> Insert evil laugh say, Jesse, here. <laughs> Jesse, you have a lot to say about him, don't oh, you? Oh, yes. That ha- how he's um the Joker for Edgelords with taste. Um, <laughs> myself. <laughs> Handsome devil, that albedo. Um, and he's like the first big antagonist, basically. Um, and most known for being Junior's brother. Uh, the long story short of Albedo is he was a scared little kid. Um, part of the URTVs, and an Udu happened to him, and that was not very good for his brain. And he was not the same since that then that day. <laughs> um. So after that day, we get Albedo. He can't die. He loves Paul McCartney, and is a drama queen with great fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Albedo facts. Um. He is terrible to realians. Uh. He is voiced by Gr- Crispin Freeman, who is. Does a wonderful and iconic job. 100%. Oh, yeah. Oh, One yeah. of his best roles, honestly. Honestly, mm-hmm. it is. And uh, a little little story there, but also when I did meet Crispin Freeman and talked about Albedo, he actually remembered, too. <laughs> like, he remembered Aww. really, really How well you playing forget? Albedo and Ganyan. <laughs> It was crazy. <laughs> Albedo is one of his favorites. Uh, he has also had a panel where uh, somebody asked, like, what is the craziest, like, most insane laugh he did? And he said, well, while this person is just, like, you know, very vain in his laughter, Albedo, on the other hand, is so just, like, drowning in his own insanity. And he basically just started, like, going, ah, 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 ah and it was just, like, he's not wrong. <laughs> He, he loved, apparently, he had loved to be that such role. a fun yeah, role yeah. to play. <laughs> like, actually, when I, when I asked a question to him, he actually went a bit more in depth on that role, and he also said something like, he even helped writing some of the lines. Some of the oh lines. really? I yeah. could see that. That's awesome. He has such a poetic way of speaking too. Um, yeah, some of those yeah. lines are delivered way too well. So, like, I honestly wouldn't even be surprised if I heard that uh, he did have a hand in writing some of those. Yeah, like he was giving a lot two. of suggestion uh, to the director or something. From what I yeah, could, I, uh, for sure. I could like understand what he was saying. Yeah. But, but his yeah. big fair line is that he's. He really wants to die, but he's also kind of, like, afraid of what dying means. And that's, I think, why it made sense for him to become a testament, because he had to both, you know, face death and face the prospect of undeath over again, if that makes sense. Yeah, but it's it's also the fact that I feel, my feel with Albedo is that he also is scared of becoming alone. Yes. Because of the fact yes. that he cannot That is die. what actually led to his mental trauma. He actually learned as a child mm-hmm. that um, he, um, after like a mission with the URTVs, uh, so we're going to go, I'm going to go ahead and like just give a little background. So Albedo is a URTV, just like Rubedo, Negrito, and um, Negrito, Negrito, and um, Citrine. They are all URTV variants. Uh, Albedo, in particular, was actually a conjoined twin with uh, Rubedo, also known as Junior. They both shared one heart when they were they they shared they shared a heart when they were when they were born, and they were just completely separated. And because of that, um, Rubedo got the red dragon power and like the red dragon variant and uh albedo got the regenerative uh variant Mm -hmm. so growing up he literally thought that anybody could regenerate the and he would go ahead and carry out some very very physical abuse to other um 
URTVs because they weren't variants and he looked down on them. But also, um, Sakura, uh, the girl who is based off of, who, um, who is basically the Momo's literal of. image of, uh, Momo. Yes. Mm-hmm. Alpha Momo. And, uh, at one point in the game, it is actually discovered when he's a kid that uh, he is coming back from a mission. They are out of the UMN dive test, and he is just ruthlessly beating the shit out of these out of these re- out of these other URTVs. And Rubido gets really angry and asks him why he's doing it. And Albedo, in the most innocent, like literal innocent manner, is just like. Oh, it's no big deal. He could just regenerate. And they're just like, oh, regenerate? What? And in English, he has a um, an energy ball. In Japanese, he has a gun, and he just shoots his head off. He has to go out in the most spectacular and... way. Even back then, he knew. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he didn't know that that was normal. So Rubito basically, like, angry at that, just punches him in the face and he's so confused, and he's like, yeah, and they're "Why?" Like beyond scared in the English version too. Yes, and yeah, I know how like the English version kind of messed it up since they changed that scene a bit, but it still carries you a still message. See their though, reactions but yeah. and how terrified they are, and it's it's mm-hmm. kind of sad because Albedo genuinely doesn't fully comprehend the concept of death or how other people perceive it. He just doesn't realize that. Other people don't have the abilities that he does, and they can't just, you know, just regenerate. Yeah, and at that point, that's when he starts getting even more clingy to Rubido in general. And he ends up, like, after that scene, when he realizes they can't regenerate, he rushes to go out and hug his brother, and is like, if you die, I want to die too. And he just starts having a mental breakdown. And then when you're in the... UMN simulator and re-witnessing Sakura and therefore Junior's memories, there is a part where Albedo is just literally digging graves where nobody could go ahead and see and that's basically like him just trying to mentally prepare for when he has to put them down because he knows he's not going to go. And that is really fucked up for a 12 year old to be doing. That is extremely fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that's a hard lifetime for me to fathom at my age. Imagine that, Mm -hmm. and then also being a war clone. Not not a recipe for a pleasant and stable life. Oh, it's a very good eventually And then eventually, uh, during during the Milchen conflict, just uh, losing all, pretty much like seeing everyone dying and like having. Like getting in contact with Hoodoo and losing his mind is just like whoa. <laughs> like yeah, it, it just got worse. Well, so the, yeah, I wouldn't even say that he lost his mind at that point. His mind was already going. Udu just sped up the process. Yeah, basically, uh, Udu just saw the weakness and went for it. Mm-hmm. And another thing to go ahead and note that's interesting is because uh, I noticed that we said that he is abusive towards realians. We don't know if he's abusive towards the Realians, per se, but we know he's abusive towards the 100 series and the prototype Hirschwashers in particular because yes. they're derived from Sakura. from Sakura. Oh, boy. Yeah, exactly. Ooh. Do we have to talk about that scene now? I mean, oh, we oh we can talk about it without going into details, you know, because yes. it's still, it's yes, still a big thing. <laughs> please. <laughs> but yeah, it is a scene that is a bit uncomfortable to watch, and especially so in Japanese and Japanese even oh, more than in yes. English. To the point, to the point that not only did the anime censor it, but the DS version censor it in the image as well too. If you look at the images, yeah. What's really yeah. weird about that part is the English version censored it, but at the same time, I kind of feel like the the English version is, in some ways, quite a bit worse than the Japanese. Oh, I agree. Let's just rip your head yeah. off, guys. That That's safe yeah, for the like, kids. Oh, I wasn't even talking about that part. I was talking about a different part. <laughs> I was talking about a mumbo part. That's the yeah. part English yeah. made worse. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about the head things. Like, you know, we're mm-hmm. talking about cutting your head off versus straight up ripping it off. The head thing was funny. <laughs> 
<laughs> which is worse. <laughs> well, I, I think I mean, the ripping it part is worse. <laughs> Well, so, yeah, the situation is that yeah. uh, Albedo has kidnapped Momo, and he's basically, <laughs> like, terrorizing yeah. her, and he goes on this rampage of, like, mutilating himself. Either in the Japanese version, he uses a knife, but in the English version, they, he uses his bare hands yeah. to basically twist off his own head, and it's... It's nice. I know how they did that. <laughs> it just yeah. rolls, it rolls down the ground, and he there, keeps speaking. They, while, there's a while his head ridiculous is there. reason why they did that too. Uh, yeah. They around that time, that's when kids were really, really, really impressionable on media, and they would try anything they saw on TV. So what did they think would be the best way to censor that scene so that they wouldn't have to jack it up to an M rating? Make that scene realistically impossible, which is what they continue to do in Xenosaga 2 as well. Because energy like, ball. anybody could go ahead and try <laughs> and take a knife and slice your throat off, slice your head off. They knew kids would do that, or do I need to, re- or need I remind you all the wrestling and the oh, Naruto Lord. stories you would hear off of trampolines? Oh, it was yeah. bad. <laughs> it was bad. Also, I had a so very... that's what they did to censor it. <laughs> well, anything involving Sorry. an actual weapon nope. tends to be touchier too, and worse for ratings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That, so Chris? they went ahead and made it um, impossible, so kids wouldn't be able to attempt it. Um, what was oh, that, Chris? Hi, sorry. I was gonna say, um, yeah. break the tension a little because, whoo, that scene is still very intense. Um, <laughs> one way they could have censored it was go the opposite and make it as comedic as possible and play the wee bowling, the strike sound <laughs> as soon as it just goes. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. I don't think it would be as impactful if they did that, though. <laughs> that well, no, fun. but it would get views. <laughs> mm hmm. Um, he's an uncomfortable character to parse. Um, yes, he is, and that scene especially is uncomfortable to parse. Yeah, but he's still like a very interesting character, and he's very entertaining whenever he's on screen because you never know what he's gonna do. <laughs> yes, very his lines in general uh, too. He, he, his chaotic energy is just one of the most memorable things about the game series. At least to me. Yes. It's also worth noting that later on, when he appears as a testament, he kind of loses a lot of that chaotic energy that we're talking about right now. He chilled out. Yeah, he, he, he chills out. out. <laughs> chills he, out. He very much, like, I think at that point, uh, because he finally witnessed death at the hands of somebody so close to him, uh... He he mellowed out very much, but he also came back because what he wanted out of everything is he wanted to go ahead and go back go back to his brother, yeah. and he was ready and willing to sacrifice himself against uh, another um, antagonist that we'll be talking about in a little bit. But his other brother went ahead and was stubborn and forced. His con- his his basically his consciousness into uh, Junior, and that basically put them put him back where he actually wanted to go all along. He wanted yeah. to be one with his brother, yeah, mm-hmm. just as they were back in the womb, which and, was interesting symbolism. And yeah, he seemed he seemed pretty happy by being there. He just went to nap, and like I guess from now on, he's just gonna talk to Junior in his head <laughs> now and then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> but at that point, he mellowed out a lot. Like I really liked his development on that because of the fact that you know when he see Junior again, he's just so chill. Oh hey, <laughs> kind of thing. What's up, yeah, brother? Pretty much. Love you. Yep. <laughs> and now he gets to take a nice long nap. He gets to chill a little bit, you know, a nice little staycation. Yes. Yeah. Pretty I was like, she's. It's like he got oh, to experience what he um, had. Mm-hmm. I was just going to say, I always like enjoyed the symbolism where they were um, attached at the back as well. Like. Mm-hmm. Yes, I always loved that. Uh, I loved that symbolism and imagery as well, too. Wait a minute. 
Did we mention the dog? Albi! <laughs> How did we glance over the fact that he turns, or it's it's really weird the way that they treat it, but the chihuahua oh, reincarnated into a chihuahua which is perfect for how him okay but how do you I get reincarnated when then your soul is held back in said existence? i don't think he was reincarnated i, I think it's more joking i'm joking don't it's take a, me literally it's a joke yeah. it's a joke oh, okay <laughs> yeah. i thought this was after, actual after, i was about to say what <laughs> after junior d- d- beat or kills in quotation mark albedo in episode two he adopts a dog at around the same time, names it Albi or Albi, and it yeah. just has white uh, or white fur and then purple eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, okay. Albi. I mean, like, the most the, you, the, you, the worst part is you have to go find the dog <laughs> yeah. in Xenosaga Three. You uh, no, no, it's an yeah, that was a nice thing. side quest. You yeah, you get it. It's my favorite side quest in the game too. But yeah, like, the case oh. of the dog, like. He's not reincarnated. It's just a dog that Junior got. That oh, I know. I, I know. Know. With te- <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. With, with their technology, it's so possible to make possibly like a dog like any color with any eye color you want as a robot type dog. Possibly. <laughs> I mean, there's designer children in this universe. I don't doubt there's fully designer dogs. It's like yeah, it's exactly. like playing the mm-hmm. Sims. Just. Pick a color. Create a sim mode. There were designer dog. dogs, though. There, Just create a dog. There were designer Build dogs. Build a dog workshop. There were. <laughs> there were designer dogs, because in Pied Piper, actually, no. they Nexus had... Nexus 6. Yeah, Nexus yeah. 6. It yeah, was exactly. a designer dog. They The real dogs were too much money, so... um. Blade so Yawakin was literally trying to, like, beg his mom to get the design dog version because it was cheaper and it still did the same thing and the beginning of the game is literally him connecting into the like old old type umn to go ahead and experience the model and see how it actually like functioned like a dog yeah and then um when uh yan go when like it's one of the first flashbacks you see with ziggy um yan went ahead and bought his son the Nexus 6 model. And he's like, I'm sorry, it's not the real thing. And he's like, oh no, dad, it's okay. He's still so cute. That is a designer dog. So designer dogs are a thing in the game. Yeah, pretty much. Cool. Yep, it's a big old, Mm -hmm. it's a big old Blade Runner reference. To mention that the Albi at the end of Zero Saga Tree is just left out with Momo. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. He got the actual Albedo back, so he's good. He's like, "Mm, no, he he ran away that one time. You can have him. (laughs) <laughs> you can't have the I don't need something. the dog anymore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, the one yes. we Which all actually, I was trying to, to say hate. earlier. Technically, the if you're one. emulating the game in widescreen hacks, I think he's the first one space that you see. <laughs> you're yeah. right. If, if you oh, really? It, yes. Oh, really? The first scene oh, that you see oh. with the mask on, if it's off screen up the 4x3, you can fully see his face. 100%. Yep. Oh, wow. That's how I, I got spoiled the first time I watched the game. <laughs> oh, that's pretty insane. Yes, oh. because uh, the thing with the widescreen, so it's it, a little little teeny tiny developer note here, because it's it's very common, especially in PSO2, mm-hmm. I mean, PS2 games. Um, when you widescreen, a uh, an emulator game an emulated game you're going to see the cutscenes in full but if it's in engine and not just um a uh, pre-rendered cutscene you're going to see some of the little um things that are supposed to be off the screen mm-hmm. to get them to go mm-hmm. not even out of bounds like when a character like, doing, like enters in like you're gonna see where they enter in you're gonna see them with like certain masks and like parts off because it's setting the tr- it's setting the um trigger yep. to go ahead and break that bring that character in there are some and uh that's something that happens quite often in the xenosaga game i played one. them all emulated <laughs> especially episode one because it was made for a 480p yeah. not, not even like a 380p resolution mm-hmm. so when you widescreen that with a hack you see a bunch of things that you weren't supposed to see including like <laughs> some really funny little animations like Xion just like soullessly looking and then just walking onto the screen and then just blinking and looking scared like you see all sorts of really weird things like that 
that's funny. But only well, if let's... you emulate it. Okay. Well, let's get but back yes. to Kevin, though. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> he, the, he is mm. the one that everyone loves to hate. If I could physically yes. fight Everybody any member of the Xenosaga cast, him. I would absolutely drag his ass outside ass and bitch. destroy this man. <laughs> that is... We should we should God. just all gang up on him. Honestly, yeah. listen. One of the things that makes Kevin particularly an asshole is that he kind of comes close to home. There's a lot of people who could probably relate to the kind of relationship that Sean and Kevin had. So, yep. like, yeah, he's, he's definitely an one that's for gonna everyone's douchey boyfriend. Uh, strike a chord for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, me, yeah, the douchebag axe. Me, one eight hundred dump him. Uh, the manipulation. <laughs> The manipulation that he went ahead and put uh, the main character through is something I resonate very, very strongly with because I was a lot like Xion in that certain relationship, and my ex was very much a lot like Kevin, very manipulative, uh, convinced me that, you know, everything was okay, that basically everything was like, you know, my fault and this and that and her like there's just the toxic relationship of kept running to him knowing she was being used is something i very much understand (laughs) very very much Mm. and it's it's not easy but kevin kevin oh my god where to start with this guy the garbage. Um, his backstory (laughs) his backstory is is sad his backstory (laughs) is sad it is um he was also he was also used as well. I will go ahead and you know admit that he was also manip- manipulated as well, but that still didn't excuse yep. any of the shit that he put the main character through. Mm-hmm. It's a classic cycle of abuse type of thing. You know, you're you're abused, and then unfortunately you end up abusing somebody else, and it's 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 horrible to see it but at the same time the way it's portrayed it's here realistic. is fairly realistic and i'm it's sure a lot of people realistic. have been through that um both, you know kevin was a uh refugee one of the few refugees from uh what was known as mictim which ironically <laughs> and get ready for the mention again uh nor uh formerly abraxas the pl- it was known as the planet abraxas in pied piper it was the same exact setting yeah. of Pied Piper, mm-hmm. um, yep. and that was Mictim. His, as his mom was turning into a Gnosis, she found an escape pod and put a young Kevin in that in that pod, and he escaped and went to a different, probably a different terraform planet. As you find out, all the planets are terraformed. That's also a really good um, intro to the game. Sorry to cut you off, but that's a really good intro mm-hmm. to the yeah, game. Yeah, it is. Yes. Ooh. It was a really good intro. Like, I remember watching that. Like, I remember getting that for release day when that came out back in 2006 and just being like, <sighs> and then I see this little kid and I'm like, oh no, that's, that's, Ke- why is that Xion's boy, why does that look like Xion's boyfriend? And so on and, and whatnot. And it was it is a really good intro to the game. It really sets the mood of what you're going to be exp- what you're going to be learning and seeing. Mm-hmm. And also understanding, hey look, this person that is dead, why why are they the be the intro of the game? Like it puts a it would it put a lot of wheels and like a lot of gears in motion in your in your brain. You're like why is this person who's dead? Because at that point, you don't know that he's actually alive. Nobody knows that he is Unless actually alive. Yeah. Of course, of, but but I'm saying like in mm. in the in standpoint yes. of like 2006, <laughs> you have no idea that he's alive, and you're wondering who is this kid and why is he there? And then yeah. you find out what that is, and it's just like, oh, oh no, it's Roth Mantle Place. <laughs> <laughs> AKA, I like to say that's that's how actual Kevin is. Yeah, and you you see a big part of that in the in the Milsha flashback. Oh my god! Yeah, we do the oh best. My gosh. The first the Milsha fl- flashback. Oof. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Chris. The first note we have in here, where you just say overall punk ass bitch describes him during those flashbacks extremely well. Yes. yes. Oh my god. 
and and also just it's interesting to note that who would have thought and this is something i will go ahead and always applaud uh, Xenosaga for doing, even with how somewhat convoluted some of the story gets at times, how much continuity they have. Did anybody ever catch on in the very first part when Ziggy is introduced in episode one that they are trying to get the 100 series and Yuli mentions that there's still another lead they have and it's a 14-year-old that graduated from Bormio? Did anybody actually expect that to be Kevin? <laughs> really? No. Yes, they mention him. They mention a pro- a protege of Ms. Rahi, and that and they're like, hmm, if he was, if this was this age, he was. It says he was fourteen and study and graduated from the <sighs> University of Bormio, oh, and they yeah. say, yeah, True. and that's actually Kevin. Yeah. Did they, didn't they, but didn't they? Did they not know he was dead by then? Or no. did they just not know? No. They did because oh. they were still looking for that student. They had no idea he was he was alive or not. They said if he's still alive, that would put oh, him at twenty four years old. Oh, I think yeah, we got three more villains though, so let's get on to the next. The next one is Telos, I believe. I was actually yeah, gonna say, yeah. Evil Cosmos. <laughs> <laughs> I mean yeah, they were both I- made by the same person, so yeah, I kind of wish there was a lot more of Telos. Like, I feel like we, yeah, she, yeah, she's one of those. She was so advertised. Yes, for, for as much as she kind of gets promoted, it was I interesting that she that was that much of her. Uh-huh. In, it was interesting in the, that she was hinted in episode one, like in the Yo, background. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, but, in the Utic ship. As, yeah, on the Utic ship. But then she didn't pop up until episode three, and then I mean, she. Was, I thought she was interesting because she. Definitely, like, she had this, like, kind of rivalry to Cosmos, where she she wanted to be yeah. the true Mary, and not Cosmos. And It kind of sucks, because, like, it plays into the whole, they are two halves, and they kind of form one, right, to be Mary, but, like, the game kind of mm-hmm. goes out of its way to really foreshadow that and build up to it, and unfortunately, all of that really only gets crammed into... The third game. I like the idea that Chelsea is like the. It's like Cosmos is kind of like the spirit, and then Telos is the body. Like that's cool. It's just unfortunately we don't get enough of that for how much yeah. they built it up. But at least we got some cool fighting scenes. Oh my god, she has <laughs> yes, this is a cool fight scene. She has. So been, I'm sorry, that. that scene where they're fighting in the grave is one of the best choreographed video game fighting scenes of all time. I am sorry. Oh, yes. And it's almost entirely I, because of her. It it's is. so good. Oh my gosh. Yes, because I remember when I was, I think it was, I was either in high school or college, I would just, like, show my friends that one scene. It was like, I need to show you guys this. This is cool. I know you hate Zenosaga because I talk about it all, all the time, but you need to see this fight scene. It, was it great. is really cool. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I think it's a scene I showed uh, early on also to Nick before he even played Zenosaga because I was like, look how cool this is. <laughs> <laughs> it does suck because if you show that scene to people like out of context, they'll think that like Xenosaga is this crazy awesome like android fighting game or something, and unfortunately, that is not what Xenosaga is. Kind of wish it was, but oh well. What no, you yeah. go from that to episode one with the slow cutscenes with no music in the background <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and the super loud background noises, or the footsteps. You can't forget the footsteps. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Although the footsteps are probably worse in Zero Saga Tree, to be honest. There is <laughs> that <laughs> echo. <It's> ASMR. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it is really unfortunate that we just don't get enough of Telos after how much they built her up. And even how much that they reference Telos after the fact. Like, she keeps showing up in other things. She was in, um... Mm-hmm. The I have a figure of her, and it pisses me off, because none of the other the, characters um, have them. Endless Frontier game, and then also in Xenosaga 2. No, Xenoblade 2, rather. And she's in Project Cross Zone. Is she in both Endless Frontier games? I don't, I don't remember that. Yeah. Tyson, yeah, she OG was. Saga, yep. Endless Frontier. Yes, she's in the, yep. both the first one and second one. I don't know I think she joins she... your... Oh, sorry. Go sorry. ahead. 
Sorry. Yes. I don't know how she is in those. I will say, um, if she's like her Xenoblade 2 characterization, I think she may have peaked with the little bit she had mm-hmm. in Xeno Saga Savvy. Which also just makes me want more of that continuation if at all possible. But we can't change the past with that. And we're probably not getting an yeah. episode four. <laughs> yeah, I'm so. not expecting anything. At this point, yeah, I'm just hoping here. for yeah. a port, but I don't think that even is going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, I point. just really wish uh, uh, with her character with yeah, it, w- it wasn't even just the fact about. of like how much she was hinted at, how much she yeah. was promoed. She was literally the goddamn center po- poster in Best Buy, GameStop, all those stores. <laughs> Not yeah. even Cosmos. Like I remember seeing this. I'm like, who the hell is this? I'm like, where's Cosmos? It wasn't Cosmos promo was, for was the always game. the poster child. It wasn't for the game. It was no, for it, the figures. It was so they could f- sell the figures. Years down the line, they had to get her ready, and then boom, here you go. Here's your anime waifu. Have fun. If that was the if that was the case, but honest to God, back then she had only one little figure, and it's sitting on my little uh, thing next to my other three cosmos. I know she <laughs> got the altar figure later on, but yeah, yeah, she did. I, but that was I years have, later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have a really expensive yeah. Telos figure I need to put together, but I haven't. Oh, I forgot yeah, about that. Yeah, you have the kit one. Yeah. You have the kit one. That's also one that came out yeah. later, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, the oh only well. two that ever got figures are those two. Yeah, well, uh... But yeah. Back to the villains. Yes. And let's move on to Yuriev. Yuriev! The asshole fodder! Welcome back. <laughs> We're down to the last two! <laughs> Yes. Can, woo. We can see the light. Yes. Oh, hey. Okay, I love <laughs> this comment with Yuriev. It says, and I quote, wants to destroy God, despite God <laughs> complex, has no interest in being God, was so afraid of God, he made 669 babies to prove his devotion to every sperm is sacred. Has been doing this for a very long time, given a hint in contact <laughs> with research. That was Robin. <laughs> that was Robin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was. Oh, that's great. That definitely was. <laughs> he would, yes. I've been yeah. doing this for a very long time, and given the hint and context of his reaches, word in the mobile game, mobile game as well. Oh wow! But yeah, Yuriev is. Uh, yeah, he's kind of another one of these characters that we blocked on before because he falls in this sort of loophole of like, he appeared, he's in the plot, he's important to the plot, but he doesn't have always screen time, so you kind of have to dig for some of his information. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, you do. He met, he met God, he, it scared the crap out of him, and now he wants to kill God. That, that was yeah, basically. that's that's basically the gist of it. But, that is the gist of it. Yeah, he also al- always wants to uh, be able to transfer his consci- consciousness into a new body, and he usually uses whatever kiddo he made that's the most compatible to do that, and uh, in the story it happens to be Ganyan. And, yeah. Shit goes down, and he does terrible things to uh, the main character, Randall, and uh, I guess we can go back to that uh, arc of, like, that end of arc of URTV where um, he basically he basically tries to go nuts on having Abel and Omega and becoming one with Udu or something. Like, he goes nuts because now he tastes the, he's tasting the god's power, but then Albedo comes into play and he's basically like, oh, nah, <laughs> you know, like, you tasted that power, but, like, you shouldn't do that. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> Albedo basically tasted that power before as well, and now he's back to, he's back to, like, more mellow out at that point, and, yeah, it's just, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, basically he tries, they try to do, Albedo and Rubio try to do the link to remove the hoodoo stuff from like Ganyan's body because it's bas Yuriev is basically using Ganyan's body. But in the process Albedo wanted to sacrifice himself and that's when as we mentioned earlier that Ganyan basically pushed its consciousness into Junior. And that basically 
ends, quote unquote, the arc of the RTV because uh, Yuriev gets destroyed along with Guinan's body. And yeah, that's pretty much how it ends for the guy. But yeah, he did a lot of crap before that, like. A lot, like, like 500 this... plus years worth of stuff. He yeah, even but met, he, also... he even quotes to sellers, I'm 500 years old and look at me, I'm no different. Yeah, basically. And he also, he also destroyed, like, the, her favorite ship, Haldari. <laughs> well, he, he, he destroyed he, a lot. Yeah, he murdered a lot of people, and oof, that was he hard to come back. He murdered a lot of kids. Back. Yeah, that too. I don't remember the series, oh, but breaking. that also resulted in the mm-hmm. loss of all, that one specific series of realians, right? The ones I that were so. pilots on the ship? Yeah. Yeah, they, they all died. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Them, uh, the all the embryos uh, during uh, Pied Piper's time, the when he was basically trying to start what would become the, uh, I think, blueprint for yeah. the URTV series. Because, uh, yeah, as we said it's earlier, like... uh, at that point, Sellers was buying time for him to do all that shit, where he would hijack the Durandal with Ganyan's body, because the Durandal recognized Ganyan's body. And yep. he basically... He wanted to get all the emulators. He basically murdered everyone, got the emulator, and got out. <laughs> Oh, well, you have Mary. Except, into except for a heart. few people that survived, but yeah. Basically, you get to rescue a few people, but not many. Yeah. What it's really, really sad. Oh, I was just mentioning the one scene um, where he's trying to get the emulators and he's like walking backwards with the gun in hand. Um, oh, yeah. With that. Godson playing in the background with no vocals whatsoever. He's just like, oh, shh. Well, this is happening. Behold, this glorious picture. And then you get those yes. vocals, and it's, oh my god, that song is Behold, god's here. Oh, I, I think y'all talked god. about it for a while god in the music is, episode, and there was a reason for it. Oh my oh god. god. Oh, yeah. Godzib is probably the best song uh, next to uh, next to Cosmos' main theme. Godzib is probably the best song in the Xeno Saga series. Yeah. It, it's one of the super huge iconic songs for sure. And that's, yeah, that's not including like the ending um, opening themes. That's just like, just as a basic, you need an idea of like how beautiful the music on this soundtrack can get. Listen to that song that plays during the Geary of Boss Fight. It's so yeah. iconic. They remade it in Xenoblade Chronicles on Wii in 2011. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right. Yeah, um, I guess yeah. that covers everything for Yuriev, more or less, without going to loopholes. Uh, shall the we move to bad guy. the final one? It's which twink is time. The ultimate. Well, the ultimate string puller of Xenosaga. Yep. And just technically, like in Xeno Gears. Main antagonist, never fight them. Yeah, you never actually fight them. Well, you do fight his mech, though. <laughs> Technically, but it's not under his control, and you only fight a piece of his mech because every single mech got destroyed mm-hmm. and turned into the final um bo- into the final boss. Yeah, it's more like the Pretty harbinger much. of it than like the actual fight. Yeah, which actually mm-hmm. describes him very well now that I think about it, but. Yes, yes, that is basically yes. what he is. Because the entire time of the series of Osaga, he was the one like pulling the strings all over and be being like he's basically the president of Vector, the boss of Ormus, and uh was he was there another party? I think there was another party, but uh, my brain is... He's the head of the Federation, he is the CEO of Vector, he is the head of Ormus, and uh I believe he is um He's another head of one of the other, um, other branches. And you can't forget so he's got connections yes. to the Catholic oh. Church. <laughs> oh, that's right. He's he also has seventy alternative he accounts. High- yes, um, <laughs> he is high. He is, he is high. Yes, he is high. Like he's the head of Ormus. He is the CEO of Factor. He is the head of the Galactic Federation government, and he is also the president. Of um of the uh, rival company that was helping uh Kevin 
uh, under the name of uh, Roth Mantel. So basically, he was he's, uh, he's the boss those. of everything and can pull all the strings he wants as much as he yep. wants. And uh, he's been orchestrating yeah. it all in the name of Eternal Recurrence because he feels that is the only way to save the save universe, the universe yeah. from total destruction. Yeah, because the universe is is doomed to be destroyed, and his only solution is to basically reset it whenever it comes back to this time of destruction. Does he retain Mm -hmm. the same, like, consciousness and memories, or does that also reset every time? Uh, From what we can tell, we're pretty sure his is the only one that stays... Like, his his consciousness resets, but his goal doesn't. Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay. So then he's also, yeah. like, yeah. not only that, but his whole existence is just to reset and destroy humanity over and over and over and over yeah. and over. And yes. we promise he's not a bad guy. We're going to show you him throughout the entire game, but he's not a bad guy. He's not. But, but he actually is. <laughs> he is quite ruthless, cunning, yeah. manipulative in his own ways. Yeah. Um, not only that, that point of the end actually isn't the point of the end. Um the universe is doomed to fail within like thirty thousand plus years. Was it from that much? Where I thought it, it was starts. shorter. If uh, we're going by the original, um, the original plot line for Sino Saga before you know it turned yeah. into what it did, um, each every two episodes was supposed to be a ten thousand year gap, with the final okay. two episodes being the end of the universe and how everybody was going to basically deal with it as in come to terms with it or embrace it maybe we don't yeah that's the thing we don't even know because it didn't say anything about save it said just embracing the end of the universe so we have no idea that's it he wanted he just wanted to go ahead and basically have a reset time for humanity to be able to keep buying time to keep that from happening, to keep that collapse Until they from happening. Until possibly could find a solution. But then yep. around the end of Zeno Saga Tree, they just like they just basically say nope to that and they, they do they their own type reset thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. They basically break the chain of eternal of uh, eternal recurrence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which we don't know if that is the first time. We don't know if that is the 4,000th time. All yeah. we know is something went different and Mary ended up defecting from Wilhelm's will. And uh, he's like, you've doomed, now what? You, now what? You've doomed us all. And instead, uh, you they basically, the end of the universe is going to happen regardless at some point they don't know when they don't know how but it's going to happen yeah Um, but i think uh, they do like mm -hmm. it's something we're never going to have because we'll never have a follow-up but the fact that they do entrust uh the main group to find the the first planet which is the planet earth basically Uh, lost jerusalem yeah Yeah. yes which is (laughs) like they, they want they want them to to find this in order to like possibly find a solution or something or like Yeah, they're yeah, they're putting the fate of the universe in humanity's hands instead of just yes. Wilhelm's hands. Exactly. And interesting enough, Wilhelm was actually it, it was it's in the perfect guide. I was gonna say it's this. in a uh-huh. translation. Yes, um Wilhelm everybody always assumed that at the point at the end of the game when they're escaping after the final boss at the end, like at the end end uh, that when they're trying to get out and uh, gate out and use the last of the UMN column pulses gates to get back to uh, away from whatever's going on, a lot of people used to think, oh, this is chaos giving them a cho- chance. This is chaos giving them a chance. The perfect guide actually states that Wilhelm is the one who gave that last UMN column pulse, pulse for mm-hmm. them to escape. So... That's it. Despite it but being that, too late, Wilhelm saw yeah. that there was there was some possible like you know there was some hope. It goes that, back to it's, so it's still kind of weird. It's still kind of weird though because uh, I remember in the cutscene uh, it felt it felt like they were also helped 
by chaos because you had the I think you, the ship got the wingies that that usually chaos would pull to give them a boost. I mean, isn't he so supposed to be kind of a Lucifer kinda. allegory? Because Lucifer is a fallen angel, so the wings could still apply with Wilhelm. I would yes. think. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. I was actually going to bring that up. That um, out of the three of them, uh, Yeshua was seen as basically the body of Christ, like the the conduit. Basically, the Messiah was the one who spread the word. Mary was um, basically the container for animus, anima, which um, which chaos slash Yeshua was, and Wilhelm was basically like seen as Lucifer, um, in a odd way when you really think about it. It is kind of cool though yeah. that he actually like you see a very visible sign that he is entrusting hope in humanity after living for however many millennia dead set on just yeah. resetting and sticking by the rules and apparently something worked because if he's able to do that shit yeah, yeah. but it's same especially time, when he was uh, facing out of existence seeing how strong the group was and how much they succeeded at doing whatever they they were trying to do i i believe he probably saw how strong their will were and maybe well, that's were... what pushed him to do this well, they all also had the component. They also all possessed the ability to become testaments in mm-hmm. his eyes. Yeah, they all could have actually became testaments. Yeah, because um, they had strong every single one of them. And stuff, and I yes. think that was a requirement oh, for becoming a testament. Did we as mention well. that he's the one who makes testaments yet? Yes, we did. Oh, okay. Well, Sorry. Oh, okay. yeah, no? yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. Yeah, I think we did. <laughs> My bad. Sorry, I was yeah. just like, wait, did we? Hmm? Okay. Sorry. Go on. <laughs> Yeah, this, this is yeah. just like... If a not, nice we did couple. now. <laughs> <laughs> but but the- yeah, his motivation was adherence to destiny. His goal was eternal c- d- recurrence. And his defeat was... <laughs> God damn it! When did uh, Bot Bride again? Because she and are too much gay love for them to allow his nonsense. Chaos also isn't fond of Wilhelm shit. Also being bad at robot. <laughs> See, I love that. I love that he said I that. Love these but quotes. at the exact same I time, love these quotes. Chaos and Wilhelm are their own gay shit. So I <laughs> like literally if you look at Xenosaga from their two level, it's two twinks chasing each other throughout destiny trying to reconnect. So <laughs> one, they just live for millennia at a time, reuniting. One of them's in booty shorts. Jesus is literally in booty shorts the entire time. Like <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, we need, now we need to. I need to mod the game so we can be in like those old school juicy shorts, and it will make it will add so much to the game. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, I, I guess this is uh this is gonna be a, a a wrap for this part. Do we close as usual, or or well, I mean, did, was there any anything else on Wilhelm that anybody wanted to add? Or I think I think we got everything, mm-hmm. and we went for. Long enough. We should probably yeah. close at this point. I called him a twink enough. I was time, about so. to say the same thing. Just, just, just <laughs> double checking. Just double checking. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. This uh has gone on very long, so we are going to probably cut this up, <laughs> and we'll talk about the Xenoblade villains at another time. Um. We can go around and uh, if there's anything you guys want to plug, um, or share anything you're working on or playing, we can do that now. Um, how about you, Justin? So I'm not sure when this episode's actually going up, but on uh, Retro Roulette, we are doing the <laughs> Zelda-thon, where a bunch of us are getting together and streaming a bunch of Zelda games. Uh, we just had Sup Arcade. They just streamed Ocarina of Time. Then uh, later this week, I'll be doing Ocarina of Time Master Quest. Um, by the time this episode is Ooh. actually up, we'll probably be past that, so... Um, if you missed it during, you know, the initial stream, we will have the VODs available for you. Um, they may be on our Twitch, and if not, they're, they'll probably be on our YouTube channel, so definitely check us out there. Okay. Awesome. Um, well, let's, I know you're low on time. Uh, Kat, how about you? I'm still playing uh, critically acclaimed MMO Final Fantasy XIV that has a free trial. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I'm working on <laughs> I promise I'm working on some of my own stuff now too, but Awesome. <laughs> they are paying me negative uh fifteen dollars a month. 
<laughs> oh my god. <laughs> you also do really awesome art. Just All right, how about you, Mary? Uh, I'm also going to join this Zelda taunting and I don't know, mine might be up after this episode is up or maybe like the episode will be up sometime after I'm up for that like for that uh, Twitch stuff. But uh, yeah, I'm going to be streaming Twilight Princess early July, so yeah. Just hoping nothing breaks by then. <laughs> Still okay. gotta do a bunch of troubleshooting. <laughs> well, good luck. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I I'm looking forward to it though. And uh, also, just to give a little shout out to uh, Brielle in here, who also is working on my layout and, <laughs> and little screen ciggies, and they look amazing so far. <laughs> Cannot wait to Aww. share them with everyone. <laughs> well, that, that's a good segue. How about you, yeah. Brielle? What are you up to? <laughs> um, currently, right now, um, a lot of in real life stuff has been happening. But uh, when I'm not doing that, I've actually been uh, streaming on Twitch uh, with my husband at uh, Mistakenly Sci-Fi, all uh, one word. Um, and I'll either be, I either stream art or I stream games, uh, definitely sometime down the line, maybe in a few months once we have a better schedule set up, uh, we're definitely looking to go through the Xeno series. We are going to go through the Xeno series together nice. as a couple. Nice. And it's, there's going to be some commentary because whew, my husband does not know how to keep himself filtered. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll be fun. <laughs> seeing it from his perspective nice okay how about you chris oh hi um let's see so i've been trying to get back into streaming um i'd actually uh glitch nebula is what the name is and i also just recently made i used twitter for a while but it's been private so i made a twitter with the same name so i can actually start promoting things when i get a relatively consistent schedule um but i'm still stuck Ooh. in monster hunter land um it's getting to be a problem i think i'm almost at 250, 300 hours. Um, oh, wow. I am begging for help. <laughs> is this for, I is this need real? help getting out of this. Um, is this for Rise? It is. Uh, it's, it's so fun. Oh my god. And now the game is you're basically complete. like me. Ugh. You're basically like me with Genshin Impact. Pretty much. <laughs> I was, you, you actually reminded me, I forgot to mention PSO2. I actually, um, made Cosmos in, uh, on ship three of PSO2 I NGS. Saw that. She oh, yeah, that so was good. gorgeous. Ev everybody keeps coming up to me asking what I used to go ahead and make it. And when they find out what it was, half of them are sad because that hair is no longer available on the player market at all. Oh, no. But the accessory parts for her visor and headgear are in the base game. Hmm. Nice. So it's, it's fun though. I've just been literally running around as Cosmos shooting guns off and it's fun. See, on that <laughs> note, great. since nice. you brought up playing Cosmos with guns and dressing up as Cosmos, I would just like to politely say to Capcom, please give me armor that I can look like her at all with anything, anything at all. Thank you. <laughs> please Capcom please contact Bandai Namco and ask for permission you did crossovers with Project Cross Zone yeah exactly <sighs> well let's see um oh, something sorry. of note uh, I forgot to plug because I'm tired uh, so things that are happening with uh, XenoUnderground.net and ah. GodSib.net uh, Xeno Underground's forums are going to be closing uh, at the end of 2021. Uh, Godsib's forums are fully open and accepting members. Uh, what I'm going to do with all of the media that is currently on Xeno Underground is upload it to Godsib and maintain my site uh, as is uh, for as long as I can, uh, and anything new goes to Godsib. That. It's a great place. Please Gotta... register. It's a really yes. great place. Yes. yes. Please Go join the forums. Go. Please, please have fun. Make small commentary. Have have fun. Enjoy the site. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Um. Other than that, I I'm not. I'm just juggling a bunch of stuff right now and editing episodes. Um. And 
uh, let's see. I'm also playing Atelier Ryza 2, which is very fun. I love it. Um, but yeah. Um, so, um, thank you everyone for, uh, joining us. Um, as far as episodes go, I, uh, we will do another episode on Xenoblade Villains. Um, and we're currently doing a poll on Twitter. This will be old news. Um, but we shall see who wins. I'm spreading my propaganda. I think, last I... <laughs> I think <laughs> yes, I think last I checked, Lao and Mascots were tied once again, so... Lao is up by, like, it's... 1%. Yes! <laughs> it's super close. I'm oh, sorry, gosh. y'all. I'm going into a lot of theory on that episode. I am so sorry. No, I, okay. I love it, and I embrace it. Um, so yeah, that'll be that, and, um... We'll just see what the future brings. Um, so, again, uh, thanks for uh, everybody for joining me and all the listeners for listening. And have a good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Take care, folks. Good night. Save the game. Is this Each my game might take us. Yes, this is yes. Welcome yes. back. Yes. Come back. Yes. Welcome Hello. Back. Hello. Hello. This is, yeah, this is why I th- said we should probably do three episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. You're totally right. Y'all caught me. I was just uh, about to so make dinner because I thought I had like 30 more minutes. I was like, oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. You dare oppose me? Jesse just went off. <laughs> Oh no! That's fine. Okay. That's fine. Let's keep going. Okay. Yeah, she had to go to bed. Okay. Oh, I have going? work soon too, but um, yeah, it's no big deal. Uh, we can move on to the next one. Then. Yeah. we don't have too much left. I mean, one if more you time. Need to I, leave, tell I will. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the- Exactly. Yes. Um. Yeah. If you need to leave cat at any point, I will probably you can just stop the audio and send it to me. I will. I'll make okay. a folder. I'll, I'll. I'll DM you with the details. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> um. Uh, I think. But, uh. I'm. I'm just gonna walk away from the mic for a little bit to take my meds and then see how far I can go. Cool. Sounds okay. good. That's just okay. That just sounds. Good. Sorry about that. Oh, you want me to step on you too? And Jesse, what are you up to? Insert Jesse. Response. Oh, I was gonna say. What I <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait, what? I'm just adding this uh, so I can. I'm gonna. I'm gonna DM her and get her response and just plug it in. Because I want. I want uh, to. Yeah, that I, is I, fair. I want, okay. Good job.